Evening everybody. I don't normally um, do a live on a Sunday, but I am delighted to do one today. Anka, who I um, did an amazing podcast with, um, A Slight Change of Plans. She's a cognitive scientist and um, a fantastic woman. And she's one of those people who, though I have never met her, we've become friends through working together. And so I can't wait for you all to meet her because you will love her too. Um, and talk to you about her podcast, the work she does. And um, so you can discover her with me. I keep inviting her and she isn't quite there. How are all of you? There she is, except so she'll be with us. I hope you've all had a nice weekend. I went to my best friend's son's wedding, which was really lovely. I keep accepting her and it keeps not letting me. Maya, I don't know why it's not letting me accept you. You have no requests. Julia. There you go, Hi. there you are. <laughs> Hey, it's so nice to be, I heard, I heard the intro, it's so loving. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's lovely to see your face. And it is strange because we've never physically met. I know. And we this met is very... this podcast, but somehow I feel like you're a friend of mine. I was going to say, first of all, I feel like our hearts have met <laughs> in oh, a pretty deep lovely. way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that the greatest joy for me of making a slight change of plans is when I get to meet people like you and, and build flat, fast friends, uh, people who I might never have had a chance to meet otherwise. And so I feel so much gratitude that, that I have you in my life and, and will continue to have you in my life. It's such a special thing that's happened. We will. So do you want to tell the lovely everyone that's um, listening and all of you that are listening, do kind of ask questions. Sometimes I get carried away and just talk myself and don't ask your questions, but I, I will try and ask your questions. Maya, do you want to tell us about you and then talk about your Apple of the Year winning podcast? <laughs> um, and then we can talk about the one that's coming out tomorrow of you and me, isn't it, I think? Yes, absolutely. Oh, and it's, by the way, it's such a joy to see my friends from England join. One of my best friends, Beth, <laughs> who I got to know when I was in grad school at Oxford. Um, she is on the call. So that's just so great to see the people across the pond joining together for this. Um, anyway, so I, um, I started this podcast, A Slight Change of Plans, and it came from a very personal place in my life. Um, it was 2020, I was feeling like so many people all over the world, just completely overwhelmed um, by all of the change that was happening um, to everybody, right? Um, we were, yeah, with globally. And in the United States, we were reckoning with such a terrible history of racial injustice. And um, in my personal life, we were grieving a loss. My husband and I lost a, a baby girl to a miscarriage with our surrogate. And I just remember thinking... Um, you, can I just pause you know, a second? You say that so yeah. quickly, and I know that is such a deep loss that you talked about very movingly on your podcast. So if anyone resonates with that, that's an incredibly moving episode to listen to. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it happened a second time, which is the one that I detail on the podcast, but this was the first, our first experience with it. And I was, um, I was just feeling so overwhelmed and even though I had navigated a lot of change in my life up, up until that point, you know, I had grown up being a, aspiring to be a concert violinist and then a, a sudden hand injury ended my career. I just felt woefully unprepared for this particular moment in time. And then what I did, Julia, is I put on my cognitive science hat, um, my psychology hat, and I realized, okay, first of all, take a deep breath. <laughs> do you want Secondly, to say to people what a cognitive scientist is and yeah. what you do for a living as well? Yeah, yeah. So quick, quick backstory on me is that I, I'm a cognitive scientist, which means I study the human mind and our behaviors and how we develop our attitudes and beliefs about the world, um, how we come to change our minds, what motivates us. It's really an umbrella for studying the human condition. 
and so as I mentioned, isn't it? How we react to things, yeah. How we react to things, how we tell stories about the the traumas and the positive things that we've been through, um, and. I've always feel I always feel like I've been fascinated by the human mind. It's not really surprising to me that I ended up in this field. But uh, if you had asked me as a child, um, you know, would you like to be a cognitive scientist one day? I would have said no because I have no idea what that even is. <laughs> um, and so and so, but what I've realized, and Julia, I know you and I talk about this on our episode of A Slight Change of Plans, is in retrospect, it's actually quite easy to connect the dots on how it is that we ended up where we are, right? Yeah. As you look back yeah. in your personal and family history, you're like, oh my gosh, duh, I was gonna end up as a, yeah. as a grief therapist. But you know, at the time you're just passionate about things. But when I look back at my, at my life, as I mentioned, I started off as a concert violinist and I think what- Which is very uh, cool, by the way. I wish I could say that about myself. <laughs> I think that is an amazing thing. Yeah, so I was I was really in on the violin thing. Um, for those of you who are classical music fans, uh, which sadly there's not as many as there used to be. However, um, so I started studying at Juilliard when I was a young kid wow. and studied wow. under I studied under Itzhak Perlman, who was my <gasps> private teacher for years. And so this was really my was life huge. for such a long time. Yeah. yeah. And then I and then I had this hand injury, and I'm like, oh my god, what do I do? Hashtag slight change of plans. <laughs> my whole identity is tethered to the violin. I had no idea how to move forward. And so, um, what ended up happening is I I had to figure out what my through line was. And I know Julia, you're familiar with these concepts being in this space, but there's a concept in cognitive science called identity foreclosure, and it refers to this idea that we can become very fixed in a particular identity certainly in adolescence, but it can persist well into adulthood. And I absolutely fell prey to identity foreclosure. I did not know who I was without this instrument. And then I tried to and figure out, okay. And pause, pause a second, just, and just yeah. that kind of fixed mindset. Generally, so life is change, as you are describing, whether we expect the changes or whether we don't expect them. And of course, those that are unexpected are, come and hit us more like a lorry. But always in response to life, the more adaptive we are and the more we can open ourselves to change and let it change us and change our identity from being a violinist to no longer being a, a professional violinist, then we are more likely to thrive. And, the, and often the thing that, that means that people have a, a, a fixed mindset is fear. Fear is often the underpinning of holding on to what you believed or who you were before, fear of who am I gonna be, fearing that you'll be less rather than that you can grow through it. That's exactly right. I remember reading your books and thinking, where were these books when I was a teenager? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this would have explained so much to me about, yeah, the fear and trepidation and, and the feeling that um, I, I expected to grieve the loss of the violin, but I didn't expect to grieve the loss of myself. I mean, I think that's really what I was confronting. That's such a, a brilliant way of saying it. <laughs> yeah, and, and, I, and I just felt, I felt like the rug had been pulled out from under me and this thing that had defined my existence and my body had literally grown around, like my right shoulder slightly elevated <laughs> to this day because of all the hours I spent doing this. And I, yeah, and I have a slightly curved spine. I mean, it was just such a formative part of my my childhood and so it's like an extension of your of a limb wasn't it it was really it was positive. i mean in the same way that people talk about being attached to their cell phones and their iphones or whatever i really felt like there were times where i would go to the airport julia and would be like oh my god something's missing and then i realized it was because i didn't have to ring my violin on that trip and so there was nothing on my shoulder um that yeah. that little yeah. and so um it was everything to me and then i think also just feeling um robbed of your potential because I think at that moment I was really at the apex of my career right like Perlman was giving me this vote of confidence I was even able to convince my Indian immigrant parents that doing music school as a future thing like for college would actually be reasonable <laughs> I think at this point they were like why don't we do the liberal arts college thing a little bit more stable but even they were on board so I felt like my whole family um, was kind of buying into to Maya becoming a violinist and so it was a very exciting um, it was such an exciting time for me. And, and then like this picture, I mean, the thing about when a slight change of pants is that it, you have a map of where you're heading 
and how you're going to get there and the belief that you can make it happen. You know, you're full of hope. And then when that's swiped away, it's like I'm on alien territory. I don't know who I am anymore. And just as frightening, I don't know where to head or what to go and there's no map. I think that's right. And I was also at this, I was in these awkward teenage years as well while I was navigating all of this, right? So my hand injury happened when I was 15. We're trying to figure out who we are in the world period during this time, yeah, this period of life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you're insecure and you have all these anxieties and you're just trying to figure out if you could carve a little place for yourself in the world. And so what I think what happened in my case is I found a little place, which was in my cozy little violin bubble. By the way, I shouldn't actually use the word cozy because it was also like fiercely competitive and there were a lot of <laughs> downsides. I don't want to romanticize the violin world now that I'm no longer in it. Um, it was a complicated space, but my passion was there, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I just carved out this little space. And then I was told that I, was, I no longer belonged in that space. And I think that was just a very, um, it was just a very disorienting experience for me. Can I just pause? Someone said such an interesting thing. Say, so Catherine has said, I just had a complete aha moment. When my mother died, I expected to grieve her loss, but didn't expect to grieve the loss of being a daughter. Oh, wow. Oh, that's wow. so that's powerful. Beautiful. Yeah, that's true. And that's when people, you know, if they grieve your partner or that wonderful episode with, your, um, with her sister, you, you grieve the, the person but you also grieve being a sister or a partner to that person, the role, yeah. I think, I think that's been the greatest learning lesson for me in starting a slight change of plans, which is I thought, okay, initially, I just wanna mine people's stories for wisdom and insight about how it is they navigate change and come out the other side. And then I had this aha moment. It actually only happened after the first season came out. So I was in discovery mode along with my listeners and I was going for a walk and I was talking with my producer and I said, Tyler, I think this entire show is actually about identity. It's about self-identity because that's what, that's what sends us into these loops of turmoil essentially, which is not feeling like we have a grasp on who we are in these moments of uncertainty or loss. And I certainly, I mean, this is again, something we talk about on, on, on your brilliant episode because um, you were so generous to come on the show um, where we, we talk about my losing, you know, that first baby. And then there's a second miscarriage where we this time lose identical twin girls uh, with our with our surrogate. And one thing we talked about and unpacked in that episode is that I was grieving my identity as a future mom, right? And so it wasn't even just grieving the babies, it was grieving in the same way that we just heard from one of these listeners. Um, you know, I was grieving my loss as her daughter, right? It's the, yeah. I, I, was, I was grieving my, my future image of, of being a parent. And that that's, a, it's so invisible, isn't it? I mean, grief is invisible yeah. anyway, um, but it's so, just even saying the word makes it more, so cognitively you can begin to grasp it because you have, a kind of image that you can see for yourself as a parent and that image is taken away from you. You can see that there's a space that you're grieving and missing, but when you're not given the understanding that it's an identity that you're missing, you know that you feel completely thrown and discombobulated, but you can't quite, when you can't name it, you can't begin to acknowledge it and then come to terms with it, come to accommodate it. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we, it's so easy also to just enter a state of, um, I, I think one thing I've learned from this whole experience, making the show, navigating losses, I'm just really bad at acceptance. <laughs> I have a really, my brain stays in shock for longer than it ought to, I feel. Well, whatever that means, just in relative terms. Everyone has their own formula, so I'm not gonna be Longer, not than you, not than it ought to, than you'd like it. Yeah, that I would like <laughs> it to, exactly. Well said. Which is Good very correct. different. Yes. <laughs> We should not have prescriptions in this space. No. Um, but I, I, I always feel like I'm clinging on. And so I remember with the violin, doctors were telling me, sorry, kid, your dreams of being a violinist are over. And I was just- Can you just tell me what was your accident? I know that's probably a boring thing. I just need to know. Oh, sure. Yeah, I was in, I just remember it was a, it was a cold summer morning. I think it was July. I was playing a, a challenging piece by Paganini. And I just overstretched my, my fourth 
well, we call this our fourth finger in violin because it's this, <laughs> it's the fifth digit. I overstretched my fifth digit and I um, tore tendons in my hand. And mm. it actually was a very complicated saga where initially I was dealing with these tendon injuries and um, I, again, kicking and screaming, taking medication, playing through pain, insisting that I get to perform, um, had surgery, all this stuff. And then I was actually misdiagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, oh uh, which is the part of the story a lot of people don't know about. Um, but that ended up leading me to take for about six years or so um, immunosuppressants and anti-inflammatories. Um, and it was actually only in the UK that I saw a doctor who, who taught me that it was a misdiagnosis. Um, but that, that was what permanently ended my career. Wow. Gosh. Lots of changes. That's enough, that's, <laughs> it's more than a slight change of plans, wasn't it? That was a long road to a, yeah. to a big change. Yeah. Um, so someone's just saying, what do you do when you have lost your identity as a mum because your children have grown up and no longer need you in the same way? Do you want to say something to that, Maya, or shall I try to Julia, you should. You're the one who's gone through the space. Though I think your kids do. So <laughs> I, I, I don't think you have lost your identity as a mum. I think you have to reconfigure and extend your relationship as a mum to adult children so that you, again, it's, it's an expansion of yourself as a mother because in some ways they're, of course, they're always your child and you're always your, their mum and that's um, unchanged. But recognising that you have to step, you know, love in action is what matters in all relationships and recognising that as a loving mum, you, this would be more Western than, than Indian, I think. Um, <laughs> that you need to allow them to step back to create their own household, to create their own life and their children, and that you move in and out in when you're invited and when you ask yourself, but not just assume that you can march in with opinions and um, orders. And so that the power dynamic is recalibrated is one of the responses. And it's painful. It is painful. And that often if the, the children have been your main focus and time and your meaning and purpose, um, you grieve that and you need to create something that gives you meaning and purpose that is different to that. Do you agree with me? And, and let me yeah, I, I love that. And I, I want to add one reflection that hopefully can be helpful to people because it is one insight that I gleaned from my personal experience that has really helped me navigate um, loss and change in general in my life, which is when I lost the violin, I tried to figure out, okay, you can't physically play this thing anymore, but what are the features of that pursuit that make you tick, that light you up? And what I realized is that it was really human connection that made me fall in love with the violin. I mean, I, I loved physically how it felt and the sounds that I could make, but um, it was the ability to make people feel something they'd never felt before that was so intoxicating to me about playing the instrument. And so this has taken me a lot of time to learn, but what I've realized is once you identify what the feature is of something, human connection, long, like whatever intimacy. It's the belonging, it, isn't it? Belonging. Then you can find that in other things. And that's a very empowering message because it makes you less attached. It's a sturdier way of building your identity. It makes you less attached to specific things or specific jobs or specific tangible items in the world and more to, again, the characteristics of those things that help you. And I think even though my careers had so many disparate pieces, right? I was in the Obama White House working in a policy role on the ground in, in Flint, Michigan, when we had a lead and water crisis. And then I was at the United Nations and then I'm uh, currently at Google and I, um, I'm starting Quite this podcast. Nine, all like of them, I've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do feel that there is a through line, which is ultimately it's my fascination in human beings <laughs> that that has led me to, um, especially with this podcast, have the ability. I mean, there are there are a few environments, Julia, where I could hop on a call with someone like you, someone I've never met before, but I study in depth, right? Read all your books multiple times, every interview you've ever done basically. And then feel like I can cut through all the pleasantries and yeah. basically quote, just get down to business and really try and forge a deep emotional connection with you. So in many ways, I feel like I'm living out 
the, I'm, I'm living out the very thing that made me fall in love with the violin through this show. And that's, that's special beautiful. And, and beautiful. That's amazing. That is an amazing way of re expand. Um, what is it? It's when people talk about uh, post traumatic growth, it's growth mm. through the pain. And that in a way is the richness of the growth that you, you grieve the loss of what you had and what you hoped for, but you have grown, you've allowed yourself to feel the pain of it and grow to expand it to be something else that you couldn't have envisaged before, but that is, does feel like growth, that feels enriching and meaningful and gives and lights you up in the way that you were lit up before. Tell us about a slight change of plans. I mean, I, I do remember the, the feeling of our conversation. I actually can't remember almost a word that I said. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember well, I loving do. it. And I remember <laughs> talking about biscuits to Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember your face and the connection that we have, but I don't really remember what, I mean, we talked about grief, obviously. Yeah, we talked about grief and I think, um, I think one of the reasons why this episode is so, so special to me and, you know, as someone who creates the show and, and helps edit the show and produce the show, I've listened to this episode now about 15 times oh <laughs> through the production process and your voice is, just consistently soothing. I mean, it never loses its magic power. So I'm sure this is one of the reasons all of your fans are such fans, which is I could just listen to your, I could listen to you talk for just hours and hours and hours and, and not, not get tired of it. So one thing that made this episode feel so special to me, it's one of my favorite episodes of A Slight Change of Plans. Um, and so I, I'm so eager for everyone to hear it, is that we share a very similar philosophical bent when it comes to how we think about grief and the human experience and storytelling, which is both of us refuse to put a tidy bow on anyone's story. I think that was true in the podcast that you produce. It's true in the books that you write. It's true in the way that you've structured your app. It's, it's, and it's absolutely true in A Slight Change of Plans, which is people's change stories are very complicated and it's a disservice to them. And painful. It's a disservice to them to imply that you always end up better off mm -hmm. as a result of loss because you don't. Mm -hmm. And I want that authenticity and I want the complexity of people's experiences to shine through. And you said something so poignant. I still remember this. Um, I, I don't think this was in the final episode, but you, it was in our longer conversation. You said, you know, it might feel good to hear that in the moment that of course you'll end up better. Of course you'll grow. Of course change will be for the best. But what you said is, it doesn't actually track with people's true experiences in life. And so there's something so unsatisfying about it upon further reflection. Like you hear in the moment and it like is a, it soothes you. It's like a medicine you take. And then it wears off in a second when you realize that there was nothing true to your own life and what you heard in that story. And so the thing that I've been so committed to on a slight change of plans and this show um, delves into all kinds of grief. Um, we have a 30 something year old health nut who gets a stage four cancer diagnosis and has to have his leg, leg amputated and a vertebra removed from his spine as life end, upended during quarantine. And he had to move to Texas to do inpatient chemotherapy. I lost your voice for a moment. There we are. I've got you back. For a second, okay. <laughs> and then we have grief where a woman, um, it's called opening Pandora's box. A woman finds out that her deceased husband had been living a second life and had been um, totally lying to her and had had multiple affairs. Um, we have stories of loss like my own episode called Maya Slight Change of Plans where in the middle of producing season two of the show, I have this twins miscarriage and it's just a cogent reminder that even the host of a slight change of plans is not, um, you know, it, it is vulnerable to change um, and, and doesn't have some Trump magic card for figuring it out. And so I ended up processing my loss two days after, um, after we navigated it. And what is so fascinating to me, Julia, about this show, and of course there are also, you know, uplifting stories like 
um, our, our season premiere uh, this season is um, from a woman named Christine Ha who loses her vision in her 20s and goes on to win a U.S. reality TV show called MasterChef, though Gordon Ramsay is, is in your, your home country or from your home country. So, um, it, but, but there's always a there's always a rich complexity to everyone's story. And one thing that has been so fascinating about this show is how on the surface, people's experiences with loss and grief and loss of identity are so different, but there's an underlying psychology that persists, that unifies so many of their stories. And the most beautiful thing, and I think, Julia, you and I might be the only people on the entire planet who think Instagram is a safe space because all we get is love <laughs> and kindness it and is. joy on this platform. Yeah. It's hilarious. I'm like, i never done social media before the show, and I'm like, what is everyone talking about? Everybody's so nice, <laughs> and they're yeah. all pouring their hearts out to me. <laughs> but I hear from people all over the world every single day about their slight changes of plan, and it transcends story type. You know, you hear from the recent divorcee identifying with a cancer patient. I heard from someone recently who said she had lost her 20-something-year-old son to, um, to an opioid overdose. And it was my episode sharing my story of miscarriage that unlocked healing for her yeah. and made her feel differently about her relationship. And those stories just move, I mean, they move you to tears, right? Um, because it's just an overwhelming experience to unify people across their change and, and, and loss. I, and I think... What's so powerful about you giving a light to those deeply personal stories is that the most personal is the most universal. Often mm. we get caught up in the external, you know, that the man had an affair, that someone's got a, a, a terminal um, health diagnosis, and we get yeah. fixed on the label of what has happened to them or who they are or if they're famous or not famous or whatever it is. And yeah. we lose the internal process and authenticity, which I think is an overused word now, which is where all of us can see ourselves in the other. And in seeing ourselves in the other, we expand our understanding of the, ourselves and expand our empathy to the other. Because when we see people through um, labels, we, dis we step back and we have judgment or a, 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 a pre, I was gonna say a pre-diagnosis. We have a kind of, well, I can't think of the right yeah. word. We make an assumption about them. We do, um, that's so beautifully said. We, we make those assumptions and people feel burdened by those assumptions. And we have to be so mindful of that because one thing I've learned from talking with people who are grieving and, and the, the episode that precedes your episode very intentionally is one we talk about, which is um, uh, a woman named Quinn Lewis. She's, she's a college student and a family friend of mine. Um, her father, Michael Lewis and Tabitha Soren are also dear friends of mine and they lost their daughter Dixie, 19 years old to a car accident last year. And I was talking with Quinn, her older sister about this loss about eight months after she lost Dixie and She's in this college environment where grief is the elephant in the room, right? The loss is an elephant in the room. And in addition to having to navigate the horror of having lost so suddenly her, her, her baby sister, um, she's also trying to negotiate all of these social dynamics, which are the assumptions people have about how she ought to be on any given day and what her mood state should be. And how she ought to be feeling and should I talk about this? Should I not talk about it? Is this and it's exhausting for the bereaved to have to, on top of everything else, have this overlay of everybody else's feelings and distortions of behavior. Exactly. And also she talked about her own assumptions of what she should feel. So that is incredibly moving, beautiful episode. And one of the things she said about the morning that she received the phone call that her sister had died in a car crash with her boyfriend was that she was in so much shock that she wasn't crying, that she wasn't upset, that she was kind of frozen. And then she was wor worrying to herself, should I, be like, should I be like this? Am I doing it wrong? And so that we all have this idea of what we should be like. And of course, that's a barrier to allowing yourself to be fully grieving because you're then criticizing yourself for how you're doing it as well as what's happening to you. That was the 
that was the piece you just identified the piece of the episode that stood out the most to me out of anything with Quinn's story. Um, we have assumptions for ourselves about how people, well, we have assumptions about how people ought to grieve and in turn how we ought to grieve in a moment of crisis. And one thing she shares is she's getting on the plane with her mom, who is of course just totally despondent because she just lost her daughter. And Quinn says, you would expect that in these moments, you don't care about what anyone else thinks. You That's lose your self-consciousness because of course your world has been turned upside down. Why the hell would you give a damn about whether you're making noises on an airplane or in an Uber? And yet she said that her self-consciousness continued throughout the course of the day. She was nervous that the people next door in the apartment to them would, they're, they're, they had a young child, they would be like, what's all this yelling? And she was self-conscious in the Uber and she was self-conscious on the plane. And then to your point, she finally gets home and she judges herself because she's the only person in the room that wants to eat a tuna fish sandwich for lunch. That's she's right. like, That's right. why have I not lost my appetite? And I don't know. She was particular... starving. That's right. She was starving and she was the only person it seemed who wanted to eat. And she was so critical of herself. Like, why do I want this sandwich when something so awful has happened? And I, I, I have to imagine that the kind of people who are in your orbit, the kind of people who are listening today, identify with this kind of constant introspection. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly mm -hmm. am fall victim to this all the time, just like existing in a world of constant self-judgment where we are not only living, but then we're in this almost like a microsecond later, we're evaluating all the thoughts your... that are going to be said. <laughs> All the, all the inner talk, well, all the what, action. Well, people who know me know that I call your shitty committee this horrible third voice that you have the thought or the feeling and then you beat yourself up for having the thought or the feeling. Exactly. And I, the reason I just, I loved Quinn for admitting this is that how common is it for us to judge ourselves in the throes of grief and how counterproductive is that? Yeah. Um, and just being honest with ourselves about the fact that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you're the grief expert, but it's kind of like, I don't know, tell me if this is right, but it's almost like there's a time and place for self-judgment and it just feels like in the throes of acute grief, that is not the time and place for it. No. And Erica's saying, um, when my baby died, I'm so sorry your baby died, Erica. I went oh, to my mother-in-law's and felt guilty um, I felt guilty for eating a Sunday roast and my husband didn't. So that's very similar. Mm -hmm. And that's that thing of, you know, we're thrown into such a difficult place that we, somehow I think part of the guilt and the, the shame and the turning against ourselves is that we don't know what to do with the pain that's so intense and so we can put it against ourselves in doing ordinary things or we want to be able to have control or we want to be able to kind of know that we're doing it right to have some feeling yeah. of control. Um, and then of course there isn't a right and there isn't mm -hmm. control. And so then that becomes very negative. So we've only got a few more minutes, lovely Maya. Um, so tell us, so our, is our episode so coming out tomorrow? Yes, it is. So I was trying to figure out, can we put it out early because of UK time? <laughs> but <laughs> we don't want to mess with the technology behind the scenes no, no. and screw it up. So uh, it'll be out at, um, it'll be up by very early morning, um, all, of, all of your time. And I would encourage all of you to listen to Julia's wise words. I, I will say that one, one thing that makes this, this episode so special as well is it really became a conversation. You know, I come in typically with lots of interview questions and I just threw my notes at the door <laughs> after, after like minute 10, um, because I just felt we had such a natural rapport and I really we'd let my- We'd never spoken, had we, before? We'd never spoken before. We'd never spoken before. Yeah, yeah it was kind of remarkable how much, um, how close I felt to you so quickly. Yeah, um, nice. it was a really was a really beautiful thing. And I just felt like it was, um, you allowed me to also bring so much of my personal story and my own personal perspective to the conversation, which was really uh, special. And I'm talking to an expert and yet you gave me the comfort level to share my own thoughts um, and my own experiences with grief. 
It did feel wonderfully intimate, and I and I hope that comes across. I do remember now seeing your face, and I remember you talking about your brother and your brother's children and being very open yourself. And I think the amazing gift of podcasts is the sense of we're invited into people's minds and their stories in a way that helps us understand our own minds and our own stories in, in thousands of different ways. But I think you do have a unique heart space where, you know, I think we felt close very quickly because as everybody watching you now will feel close to you because you have an amazing capacity to give this feeling of, it's a sort of a warm energy, a heart energy that comes across very powerfully that invites me and I think anyone watching you now to step towards you and tell you more and find out more and get closer. Um, and that's really, really special. Um, and, and, and Beth Foster saying, please, please save the video so we can share and watch it. We will. Uh, <laughs> we will save the episode and you will be able to show your husband. Um, it'll be on both. I'm going to put you as a collaborator. So that yeah, you can that's put it on great. Your... Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm just so grateful to, again, have had this conversation. I hope, um, I hope everyone who's joined today will listen to A Slight Change of Plans and listen to Julia's episode and, and also listen to, to Quinn's episode, which is called Losing Dixie, because again, they really are a companion they are. set. They, they complement each other really, really well. And um, again, I'm new to Instagram. <laughs> this is like my fourth Instagram live ever. Julia had to explain how all this works to make sure that I was okay. Um, but I, I really enjoyed being, I really enjoyed creating this profile and being able to share a behind the scenes glimpse of of the show with everyone and, and just thoughts on change. So um, I look forward to welcoming as many of you as are willing into my, my little Instagram community. And into your heart. I mean, I think once they've listened to one, they'll listen to the others like I did. Um, so all of you, uh, thank you for joining us on your Sunday evening, because it's evening here. And those of you who are on Maya's time, <laughs> your Sunday, uh, Sunday morning, brunch. <laughs> have your brunch. <laughs> So, yeah, it could um, be frankly listening to us instead. Very thank touching. Thank you all, and um, take care, all of you. And lovely seeing you, Maya. And we'll we'll be in touch soon. I'll listen to Absolutely. the episode, and then we'll be. Well, I'm, I never listen to myself, but I, I maybe I will. I'll listen listen to this one. I'm telling you, because again, just view it. It's a conversation. Okay. All right. <laughs> You're Lots so lovely. Okay. Lots of love to everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone.